Well, this is a weird reading, uh, and it's all about uh, the people of Israel worshiping idols and worshiping an idol, <laughs> worshiping this idol, which is uh, the Egyptian god Asus, and it's the god of fertility and the god of power. And so uh, this is the this is what they made an idol look like, or this is one of the rendition, renditions. But there's a lot of questions in this scripture passage that I want to unpack, and then we're going to move to idolatry. Uh, the first question is, where did the gold come from? Yeah, where did the earrings come from? They were slaves. I don't. The last time I checked, slaves didn't wear earrings, uh, and they had the men, the women, the the. Uh, the young people they all had, and they melted this this gold down. I don't even remember Yahweh saying, you know, when you leave, uh, make sure you take the gold with you. So I had to do a little research. I said, where did the gold come from? Well, guess what? After the tenth plague, which killed the firstborn of the Egyptians, uh, Pharaoh's son and livestock and all of that, the people wanted them to leave so quickly and they wanted to leave now they paid them to leave and they paid them with gold uh -huh. and so they basically the Lord said get the gold from the Egyptians who want you to leave and you can take that with you mm -hmm. so if you don't believe me check Exodus it's in there so that's where the gold came from so uh, the gold was what the Egyptians had they gave it to the Israelites before they fled. Okay, so that's one of them. So the the other thing is, is what's going on here? It's such a strange reading. I mean, right before this, we have the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord thy God. The first commandment: You shall not have any false gods before me. And the second one is: You, you won't make any graven images. Mm -hmm. And what was the people's response after the other eight were read? We are your people. We will do this. We will not make graven images. We will not do these things. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't keep that for very long, did they? They immediately moved into um, building something as an idol. And we'll get into why they did that in just a second. One of the other things that we need to uh, understand in this reading is about um, the relationship between Moses and Yahweh. If you look closely, when Yahweh is really angry, whose people does he say that people are in this reading? He says to Moses, your people yeah. Right, yeah. are doing this. Your people are doing this. And because they're doing this, I'm going to destroy them. And what does Moses do? He doesn't say, yep, they're mine. <laughs> he says, uh, no, au contraire. <laughs> they're your people. You're the one that brought them out of the land of Egypt. You're the one that uh, rescued them. You're the one that parted the sea. You're the one that demolished Pharaoh's army. They're your people, not my people. And wouldn't it be ridiculous if you rescued them and then obliterated them? I mean, what would the Egyptians? <laughs> I mean, that's just awful. I mean, you know, they're going to just say, boy, what kind of God do you have that rescues you, brings you out to the desert, and then just wipes you out? And so Moses, like Abraham before him, is a very good bargainer. I don't know if you remember Abraham with Sodom and Gomorrah. If you can find 50 people, how about 40? 30, it's kind of like the auctioneer, <laughs> 20, 10, 
If you can find, if you can find five good people, I will not destroy it. And Abraham wins, and so does Moses. God relents. We won't go into the whole message of, of what kind of God are we talking about that he, that changes God's mind because that's problematic and there's all sorts of other issues uh, around this. Because obviously we're talking about God who is being anthropomorphized and we're moving away from a God who wakes up on the wrong side of the bed in the morning and gets angry and obliterates creation. Basically the story of salvation is this. We are God's people. God loves us completely and unconditionally, and there is nothing we can do that will change that. And boy, do we try to do things to change it. We fail. God always comes through. So we're going to talk about idolatry for a few minutes. Why did the Israelites freak out. I mean, Moses had quite had some walking papers here. Why did why did they okay? He's gone, he's up there with in the mountain, he hasn't come back. Um, so why why did they freak out? And what were they afraid of? Sorry. Yeah, I thought they felt abandoned. They hadn't seen him in some time. We don't know how long. And he clearly wasn't visible to them from where they were. So they were scared. Fear. Fear. So they were afraid. Uh, anybody else? I saw a hand go up here. Again. I thought I think it's kind of interesting that they, Aaron, Try to make the narrative be that this was the God that led them through that has been leading them. It's like that's kind of an odd narrative. <laughs> it's an odd narrative, and it's really odd for Aaron to suggest this. I mean, he's yes. like number two. He's supposed to be, you, you know, you're kind of it's kind of like Pastor Andrew is leading me to help you today, and then I say, Well, why don't we just go uh worship false idols? Right. You know, um, so Aaron's number two, and he's not doing a great job, to be honest. Uh, and so, uh, and then this, so idolatry, I think, is rooted in fear. Uh, and uh, as human beings, we are, we're pretty much afraid of everything. Uh, and in fact, in scripture, it's, for 365 times, you will find in scripture, one time for every day of the year, we hear a message that is repeated over and over and over again. And what's that message? Be not afraid. Be not. Because fear will move us into idolatry. Fear will move us into worshiping something that will that we pretend will help us not to be afraid. The problem with idols is that they uh, they don't work. Hearing that story today, it really struck me how it's also a story of leadership and how uh, enormous the task of leadership is that Moses undertook. And when his number two is then left facing this mob <laughs> that can turn on a dime, he's just like, okay, no, thank you very much. Let's find something else. And just, you know, rather than be the heat sink, you know, we can heat transfer and melt down that hole that don't come after me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Aaron's free. So there's fear again. Fear moves us to worshiping things that we think will take away our fear. But there's only one thing that will ultimately cause us not to be afraid, is when we come into knowledge, direct knowledge, that we are supported by God, that we are, that God is in us, we are God's children, and if we know that down to our toes, if we know it in our experience, then nothing else 
really satisfying. But we will try, without a doubt, and God lets us try. All these things. To show you the power of idolatry, I have a parishioner. Her name is Thea, and uh, it comes from the, uh, the Greek word God, so I always call her God uh, when I see her. <laughs> she's, she's 94, and she lives at Ida Culver. And I talked with her, and she is worried that she won't have enough money. 94 years old. She has over a million dollars. <laughs> and I finally, in order to point out to her that her idol or the center of attention needed to be moved, I said, you can start worrying about money in the year 2049. <laughs> She's 94. <laughs> Let it go. But we are told over and over again that if we have this, if we buy this, if we do this, then that will make us whole. We even call it retail therapy. Mm, true. But it doesn't make us whole. I mean, how often do we experience buyer's remorse? Mm -hmm or anything that we have that we think this will do the trick. And you know, it does for a moment. Mm -hmm. It actually does for a moment. I mean, I think Aaron was off the hook for a little bit until Moses came down, melted the golden calf or, and destroyed it, and then forced all the Israelites to drink it. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> that would kill you. you? No, gold. No, not, 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 not a glass full of gold. <laughs> but it, was, it wasn't actually not that I should say. It was pounded down and it was powderized in powder. powder. <laughs> put with water and they were forced to drink their life. Oh, wow. And then, by the way, 3,000 people were also killed that were in the center of the worship. Mm. There are rip roaring good stories. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so the idea that this idol is going to satisfy. So we named a lot of idols already uh, in our discussion group, and I just wanted to review a few of those. Uh, one is, is interesting, uh, is, is the idolatry of whiteness. And I, I'd like to change that. Anders is, is preaching today about the idolatry of whiteness, and certainly, uh, we're part of that. And we also are part of the idolatry of light skinniness because that permeates the whole world. Mm. Thailand, Asia, Africa. Mm -hmm. So this idea of that the lighter skin you are or the whiter you are, somehow you're better. You're part of the, if you will, the land and gentry. Another item, money. Mm -hmm. Social media, political power, any kind of power, religious power. Those are idols that we think will actually satisfy. I think the people in our in our world today that are wielding a tremendous amount of power. I think of uh, Vladimir Putin. He is worshiping the idol of maintaining power. And yet he's losing it by the bushel form. Finland's now part of NATO. Sweden's part of NATO. Uh, there's more people belonging to NATO than there ever were. So whatever you thought was going to work, just worked in the opposite way. Anytime that we put something at the center of our lives, something that we think will complete us that is not a relationship with God and God's people, with, the, with, with creation, we will be left wanting. And so what's quite amazing to me, though, is how patient God is. God will let us try everything to put it up. Alcohol, drugs, Sex, 
whatever we think of food, uh, you name it, we believe that something of these things will complete us and make us whole. And God knows because he made all of us like donuts. We all have a hole in us. <laughs> and there's a center there that's empty. And we will try to cram it full with something because we can feel the emptiness. But the only thing that fills is God's very self. As we find him in a relationship of, of uh, praising, of following, and being a disciple. That's what Yahweh wanted from God's people. Follow me. Trust me. Now, all kinds of bad things happen when we get impatient. Abraham and Sarah were impatient for a son because they waited a long time. So they had Ishmael from a slave woman and a whole different group of people who was born because they didn't want to wait for Isaac. The Israelites didn't want to wait for Moses to get back. We don't want to wait in order to God's, to, for God to unfill, uh, unfold God's plan or God's very being in us. And that's what this whole Lenten journey is all about. Mm -hmm. I always wonder why the people in the dead, uh, by the, why the Israelites spent 40 years in the desert. I mean, were they really that bad with directions? <laughs> it's not very far. They wandered in the desert because all the people that had been free from captivity, that generation that was free from captivity um, from Egypt had to perish and had to die off so that a new people could enter into the promised land, including who? Moses. Moses. He, had to die too. Yeah. he was the last one. And again, he was impatient. He hits that rock twice because, come on, let's get things going because I'm really tired of all of this belly aching. And so idolatry is our impatience, our ego saying, we know better. We know what's right. We know what's good. We know what is holy. And what we do as disciples of Jesus, as followers of Jesus, on the way, is trying to have a discerning ear of what is truly good for each one of us. What is truly that builds relationship with the God of the universe and what builds relationship with each other, especially for people that are different from us. I love walking into your church today. And we love those who, and that one that struck me was those who don't vote the same way that we do. <laughs> <laughs> especially during an election year <laughs> loving others is, is a pathway to finding God loving God and being patient on this journey because God will have God's way with us remember this the universe was created 14.5 billion years ago so God has time on God's side. <laughs> We're impatient. God continuously loves us and abides with us and journeys with us as we move towards that goodness, that love, that unconditional relationship that we are all invited to.